know for a fact. All right, so it's recording now. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so now we have to do it really just for the, the sake of recording. Yep. Okay. All right. Can uh, you record on your side too? Concurrently? I think so. Record on this computer or record to the cloud are the options I have. On your computer. <clears throat> I mean, it says recording. Okay. So I guess we're doing it on both ends here. Yeah. Although, you sure you don't want to stop the recording and start it again when it's relevant? Oh, no, I'll just, I'll cut it out. Okay. I'll, I'll cut everything out before this. Because I really didn't have any small talk prepared that was going to be recorded. Oh, it's all, you know, no jokes, nothing, nothing. Uh, yeah, I know. That'll get us in trouble. So we're good. How about that uh, sports team that's not playing, huh? That's something. Yeah. Yeah, I actually didn't realize that you had windows right behind you. I never see those windows because you're standing right there, typically. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. I live up on, on a hill, so this, this sort of overlooks the, the town a little bit. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, it's nice. There's a lot of light in here. Um, you know, I originally, when building the room, was not thinking about it being used for Zoom purposes. Mm -hmm. um, it's actually not great in some ways because there's a skylight above me, and the... Uh, too much light causes it to be, you know, uh, dark actually in the, in the, on, you know, session. So it's kind of yeah. a drag. Yeah. It's like paradise here. Weather-wise it's really it nice. Really? Well, this, yeah, this is the time you put up with a lot of crap. I feel like, uh, living here, uh, -huh. uh but this is the time of year where it's really nice. What's uh, what is it right now, temperature wise? Seventy degrees. Oh, that's perfect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's kind of perfect. Uh, I'm spending a lot of time in my hammock these days. It's great. Is it like an out, uh, obviously an out, outdoor hammock? Yeah, yeah. But I uh, I I get such a good nap going in a hammock. I would not be opposed to having. <laughs> an indoor hammock at all. And I've even thought about like, maybe I don't need a bed and just get a hammock. Yeah. Wow. Did, you don't it. get like back issues at all from it at all? Well, I, I have uh, back issues. Um, and I have found recently that the hammock, it, I don't know if it's hurting or anything, but it, it definitely feels nice mm -hmm. in the hammock. Um, so I don't know. Do you have back issues? I, I do. I don't know what's, what's from me. These from the gym or the bed. I don't I have no idea. But yeah, mm -hmm. I, I get sore backs all the time. Okay. But it's not like a paralyzing, like an injury. No, 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 no. Yeah. It's, I think it's more behavioral things that I do. Okay. Yeah. You know, I actually think it's going to be me and you on this, on this call. Okay. Well, uh, we'll have fun with it. Okay. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'll make it. I'll make it. I'll make sure it's fun. I'll, I'll uh, you know, we'll do it a little different, probably. <laughs> we'll see. Um. All right. Because otherwise also, it's gonna be. Bit. Otherwise it's gonna be a little awkward for you, I think. I I think you're right about that. Yeah. Yeah. It's a little bit weird. Right, so I think we might do it a, a, a different. All right. Let me think. How would I, how would I do this? Make it fun. Okay. We'll, we'll make it kind of interactive, all right? Um, okay. Assuming assuming no one shows. If someone does oh. show, we'll keep it normal. But We've if got we, one person that's, that's is, in there. We do? Wait, yeah. someone showed? Oh, okay. You saved by the bell, Jonathan. I was going to make this really interesting. All right, hold on one second. Where's the uh, panel at here? Well, I'll just admit them. Okay. Oh, you, you lucked out. <laughs> Uh, I cracked myself up. I'm, I'm really silly. Okay. Uh, thank you for joining us. I, I, you saved Jonathan from an hour of me um... <laughs> torturing me with questions. <laughs> Essentially. <laughs> yeah, that's that's pretty funny. I was gonna I was gonna go off and have a fun actually. Okay.
we'll do it another, another time i think we'll do it to where it's kind of like more of a interview session and, <laughs> yeah we'll just kind of we'll keep it light next time okay oh there's more so you totally yeah, lucked out on. john <laughs> thanks Hi, for man. joining How us i'm glad that you guys are all here you, you saved jonathan from um an hour of me uh, berating him with, with questions and being silly. How are you? Where are you guys from? Uh, I'm in I'm in St. Louis, Missouri. Jonathan's in I always Boston, but around Boston area. I'm from Denmark. Yes. You were on last last time. Oh, first time. I first couldn't time. make it last time, but I haven't found the video from uh, last time. La yeah, last yeah. time the video, uh, I'm going to blame it on Jonathan. I think Jonathan shut the video off last time. <laughs> so we didn't have a, a recording, ah. um, unfortunately. We're going to have to do another one. Yeah, we're going to have to do another one for sure. Everything that was said the last time was incredibly witty, profound, uh, and course. insightful. So. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thanks for being here, guys. Um, well, let's see. I someone's speaking, but I can't. I can't. I can't hear you. Yep, I, I can see you, but I can't. Uh, I can't. Uh, Manon, um, if you check the lower right corner of your screen, and next to the mute button, there's a a, a menu that comes up, and uh, you can select microphone and speaker. Okay. I don't know what you're showing me, but it looks like a Scarlet. Okay. Scarlet. If you, if you pull up this menu, the Scarlet, if that's plugged in, should, should come oh, up. Oh, she doesn't have a, she doesn't have a mic. Oh yeah. Well, okay. Well, that, there you go. That'll do it. Yeah. She doesn't have an input. Right. <laughs> I think that's what she was showing us. Okay. Well, you could still go back and use your computer audio depending. It's Romania. Romania. Okay. You sound super pixelated and from a distant galaxy, Can far, far away. That's fantastic. That's. Can you hear me now? <laughs> yes, now we can. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. The thing is, what I was saying is that I will have to uh, turn off the video because I live in the country. Sure. And I just want, and, and the, the connection is pretty bad. So it's better for me to uh, put the video out, but I just wanted to say hi and oh. not you to think that I just, that I'm ha hiding. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, yeah, I'm hiding as well uh, for the same reason. I'm in the countryside as well. So okay. I just keep the video off. Okay. Sounds good. And then Rod, I'm there. Rod was, were you on last time with us too? I believe so. Uh, you might just be hanging out. You can, all right, so, right, if you can't hear us, or if you can, just uh, let us know in the chat box, okay? Maybe you can let all of us, uh, all of you can let us know um, in the chat box. Yeah. Uh, a bit of uh, maybe how you're using the program. Um, this, this third training of this series, um, is is going to focus on mostly um, things that happen in the later stages of of the production. So um, exporting, exporting for ACX, and some things that are specific to exporting for the um, uh, libraries for the blind. And some of our the people on past calls work for some of those. Some, you know, it's a mixed bag of who's here. So um, I'd like to know, um, you know. Yeah, how, I. Yeah. I personally work at the CNIB, so where we we have a few um, colleagues that will be joining very soon as well. Robert Gordon, um, and and actually we uh, we produce for the blind, and so I'm interested in. I mean, I touch every aspect of pre-production, production, and post-production. So every detail, every technical detail, does interest me a lot. Okay. Hi, Robert. Hi, Robert. Your colleague was just um, just singing your praises here. Um, so that's good to know. Um, we will get in there and do some of that. So if um, anybody else is not 
um, in those fields, some parts of this won't be so relevant, but hopefully there'll be uh, enough of, of it for everybody. Yeah, but anyway, it's just, this is kind of, we have some kind of overview here and we do expect to go further in the research and exploring later on. Uh, okay. You know, besides that presentation anyway, so don't, don't, don't worry about that. Yeah. Okay, great. Thanks. Thank, thanks for saying nice stuff, Manon. <laughs> Hi, Robert. Hey guys. So I'm using it for, is, this is Vibeka from Denmark. I'm using it for uh, an audiobook. Okay. Yeah. And would you be um, looking to export your audiobook for, you know, to, to put up on Audible? Uh, no, uh, I mean, it's more local here in Denmark uh, because of the language. Of course, I don't do audiobooks in. Um, in uh, English only. Well, we'll still get into that, that some of that stuff anyhow. Yeah. All right. Hey, Jonathan. Yes, I, Robert. I can, I can tell one thing that is particularly uh, on my mind when I think this, uh, think about this thing, and that's training volunteers. And I think yeah. you have some experience with this. I have heaps and heaps of experience with that. Yes. Yeah. And it, that's, that's actually been one of, the, one of the things that's made us hesitant about rolling into a whole new way of recording uh, is just how not everybody who's coming to us is coming with a technical background. Really what they're coming to us with is a talking background. They're almost always people that are teachers or performers and that sort of stuff. So trying to communicate and uh, Bring somebody up to where they need to be uh, about new software is a challenge. So I'm interested in hearing how this has gone for you. Okay, so um, this might be boring for, for everybody else, but here it is. So I worked uh, uh, at, at Perkins and we, um, we had this staff volunteer group of about 70 people. And when we made the transition to Hindenburg, we had to deal with two two fronts. One of them is getting people who exactly what you had said, Robert, who are less technically apt to learn um, a new thing. Uh, so I'll, I'll talk about that part. The other part for us was um, it changed how we were doing things um, in terms of, uh, you know, the structure of it. So one part of it, um, what, well, what we used before, is we were using, um, uh, what was it, Sony SoundForge. And then we would actually make the books, um, the part of the process where the books have to play in the players, we would use this uh, horrendous program called Book Wizard Producer. And um, that's, that, that part of it was, and I'll get into this in the, the training a little later too, but it was extremely cumbersome. And looking back at it, we had, you know, these, files that were in like uh, different pieces and all of this stuff. And it was, I, I'm kind of amazed looking back at it, how it ever existed. Um, but that process of, of, of uh, converting the workflow change and training all the volunteers, that took a long time. Um, and because we also had what we called hybrids, meaning books that were started in the old system and, you know, had to be you know, picked up in, in the new system. I guess what I would say is it's absolutely worth doing because long-term uh, you're gonna have to do some of those things anyway, I would imagine. I don't know your setup um, you know, and the ins and outs of things there, but uh, you will have to, if new standards or something like that come across, you, know, you do have to deal with things changing. Um, and so I'm not gonna lie, we, we lost some volunteers in this who really couldn't do that. We had some folks that were, you know, there's a lot of retired folks and some were, were uh, older and, and it was just too much, or they just weren't interested in learning something new. Um, and so, you know, uh, we weren't able to keep everybody. That ended up in our case working for the benefits. We had this, huge, you know, too, too many people, quite frankly. So, but for us, we had a, a, a multi-step, uh, training process, both for um, 
so people would come in and they would have like three uh, levels of the training and then we would kind of phase it in slowly. And, you know, once you were clear with, you know, par part one and you would have to pass a little test and these are very lenient tests, but, and it was just basic things like just starting and stopping the recording and just getting used to it. So the thing about this program is that all audio programs are daunting, especially people that aren't used to working with audio. And so many parts of this, we're going to be much more into the, what I would assume, uh, Robert and Manon, that you uh, guys will be doing and won't be for your volunteer staff. But many parts of this are about just it's, if you can limit it to these three kind of functions, stop, start, stop, playback, um, and just, and getting used to, I mean, I remember training people a lot on zooming, just zooming in with the mouse. It's very unfamiliar for people. And you know, you're, you're constantly having to do that. So, um, but if you, so there's some re repetition there and I would separate the things that people need to do into like three different sections. So we would have, you know, kind of like what we're doing here, training one, training two and so on. And, you know, you would like pass our little course and then, you know, um, that's the way that we did it. And we found that it worked and we got better, you know, at doing it as it, as it, it went along. And then the other thing I would suggest is if you have any cases, let's say, that are going to be frustrating, uh, maybe have an honest discussion about that beforehand so you don't stack them all together. So uh, if you know some people are going to likely get it a little faster than others, you know, intersperse the kind of uh, more problematic uh, cases so you're not just constantly dealing with, you know, train people and it's really hard for them to get it. Jonathan, and, on that note, let's just jump right into it because I don't want to like, you know, stop your, your flow. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. So with that, um, so some folks were here um, last time. Some folks were here at the first training and uh, maybe there were some folks that haven't been here at all. So we're going to be covering host of things. The first thing I'm going to start off with is a review roughly of what we talked about in training one and two. And then we're going to get to the subject of this, which is uh, some reviewing, adding markers. Some of this will be relevant to the, um, the folks doing the, the work with the, uh, the blind, uh, especially. Um, and putting in corrections, that's a, that's a huge thing. And then the final production um, and exporting part of things. So uh, noise reduction, RMS levels, um, different things you can do for auto leveling, how to export a section of audio or um, export it for ACX and all that kind of stuff. So, and we'll try to leave some, some time at the end for questions. So hopefully that all makes sense to everybody. And if you guys have questions uh, throughout the course of today's training, just go ahead and drop those in the chat box. I'll make sure that Jonathan gets to answer those at the very end, okay? All right. So uh, I'm going to start to. I'm going to be sharing my screen here. Okay. All right. So here we are. Uh, just a brief overview, and bear with me if uh, you're very familiar with this stuff, and um, you know we have gone over it. But good for everyone to you know. Know what we're doing. So this is what Hindenburg looks like, um, Hindenburg ABC. Uh, it, what separates it from the other versions of Hindenburg is uh, the manuscript area here at the bottom of the screen. And what that is, is in the manuscript, you will be building the structure of the book. So parts, sections, whatever is in your book. And uh, there are a couple of ways you can record, but the idea is you record and you link that audio to the manuscript, okay, to the, the sections there. So when you have, uh, you know, your book, uh, you can jump to different parts of the book and we'll get to this today. You can actually export different parts of the book as well, okay? Um, so these, uh, the controls over here are going to work like most of our audio programs here in the uh, edit window. Um, you need to record enable the track that's over here in the far left. Uh, when you do that, you can start recording. And the way that you do the recording, I'm doing this on a, a Mac laptop, but you know the process is going to be similar if you're on a PC or whatever. Um, the 
forward right arrow is going to be uh, start the recording. The back arrow is going to stop the recording and the space bar is going to be playback. So if I hit this arrow, it's going to be starting the recording here. And it's going to, what you're seeing is, I'm just going to zoom in a little bit. You're seeing the top half of the waveform here. Oh, I think that's probably better for folks. Um, of, of what you'd see in maybe some other audio programs. So that's, if it looks a little strange, you're not used to it, but I think most folks are Hindenburg users and are used to it. Okay, when you stop the recording, uh, it's going to be that this track is highlighted. Okay, you can click in the track in, uh, I would suggest clicking above it in this um, black area. Uh, you can click in the track itself, but you uh, might also end up highlighting the whole track. Okay, and if you wanted to re-record a section, I'm just gonna pick here arbitrarily, we're gonna hit the same forward arrow and you'll see a couple of seconds of pre-roll, meaning it's gonna play uh, two seconds before it reaches the cursor. And when the playback reaches the cursor, we'll be recording again. You'll see that highlighted in red waveform here. Oh. So now it's recording again. If you, you know, we're gonna do a second take. And of course, if you're doing an audiobook, your audiobook is gonna be filled of all these starts and stops and different things like that, okay? So all I did was I hit the same uh, forward arrow that I used to record. Um, if I go to the top here in my manuscript, we started kind of out of order, but um, it put in this first uh, little yellow icon automatically. And this is a nav point or navigation point. And uh, that is going to allow us to go to different sections of the book. So if I were to do this uh, recording bit again, doing a pickup, I'm going to press the record uh, button. Forward arrow. Okay. And it's just recording as, as it normally would. And if I hit this arrow again, what's going to happen is it's going to cycle through and put in a nav point that corresponds to the manuscript. Okay. And so this is how you would put them in throughout the book. All right. I'm just putting them in, you know, arbitrarily here, but then later on, once you stop the recording, you can, in the manuscript, go to different sections of the book by just clicking on the heading. As you can see with the cursor, it's jumping to the different nav points here, okay? So that's basically how that part of it works, how the recording part works. Um, we also talked a little bit about some... Jonathan, I'm gonna, I'm gonna interrupt real quick. Can yeah. you show how we can set the preferences uh, for pre-roll? Yes. We go to preferences. Okay. So it, uh, that's just in under Hindenburg here. And here's where you'd have, this is my interface. You could set it to whatever different mics um, interface. This has things like, uh, so the second option interface is where you'd have the option of adjusting the pre-roll here and other things like you don't need to record with pre-roll um, or anything like that. Okay. So that's where you do it. So just one more time. And then advanced, you have only a couple of options. Um, this one here is interesting. Um, the program is set to um, do auto level, but if for some reason you didn't want to do that, you can turn it off here. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later, right? So once again, Hindenburg, preferences, and the second option, interface. All right, so another tool that um, we talked about last time, which is really, really useful, is this favorites window here. And uh, what I have in there is a couple of different room tones. And we talked last time about how one way you can use that is, um, for editing, both for pasting and for inserting in different um, bits of room tone. And you'll definitely need to be doing that when you're editing chapter headings and that kind of thing, but editing just as you're you know, going along. So let's just say here, oh, 
that I wanted to get rid of this noise that I've highlighted here. By the way, uh, highlighting, you just click in the black area above the file and you can always adjust that highlight here. If you ever put in a highlight accidentally, you can hit escape and it'll go away, okay? So let's say I wanted to get rid of this here. It was just an artifact I didn't like. Um, I highlighted the area and you can see down here at the bottom right, the in, out, and time. What that means, the in is the green, the out is the red, and the totality of that time is here in the, the, uh, the last option here, time. So this is 0.9 seconds, basically one second long, okay? So if I pull from one of these guys here in the favorites window, I can paste over it. I think of this like painting, you know, you're saying, I just want to cover this area and it does that. Okay. So that's pasting. The other option is um, if you needed to add some time to a section, what you can do is wherever the cursor is, the white line, you can insert. And what that's going to do is put in the total of the three seconds of time. Okay. So you're going to be needing to do that for um, chapter headings and things like that. Um, we talked a little bit about that last time. All right. So recording. We also talked a little bit about narrating um, and I had some other questions about that. Uh, there's a lot to get into there. I don't know if some of you folks are narrators yourself or if you're training narrators, um, but just some general, you know, things with that. Um, consistency is, is, is a big problem with audiobooks compared to other audio formats because you're needing to come back to things that happen in earlier parts of a book. But, you know, in the process of recording, you might have recorded this section, you know, two months ago and you need to recall characters or voices or things like that. So um, we were huge sticklers about pronunciation because we don't want to be inundated with uh, corrections and that kind of thing later on. So the best tool or approach, in my opinion, to uh, post-production is handle it in pre-production uh, by far. So that means taking the time to look things up and then keeping a tip sheet, um, meaning some type of uh, document where it's clear how you pronounced it. Did you say Bernstein, Bernstein, or proper nouns and those pronunciations and things like that. It sounds like small details, but if you've ever gone through a book and replaced, um, let's say it was about uh, uh, Barack Obama and for whatever reason, the person said Barack Obama and they just got it wrong. Well, you can't leave that. And if you've ever you know, had to go in and replace those things or decided we need to re-record an entire book, those things have happened, um, you know, it becomes a big deal. So taking the time there and then consistency with mic placement is probably the other big thing. Um, the rule of thumb of just having the same posture, uh, being roughly this far from the mic so that you're not so on it that you're creating plosives, but you're not far away and it sounds like you're in a tin can, okay? Um, so just you know, general things about that with narrating and then also um, we always try to keep this idea of imagine that you're um, telling reading from a book to somebody that's in the room there with you, you're gonna perform in a different way than if you're reading in a closet in your house, but you wanna have that type of performance on the audio. So anything that you can do to make it seem like you're telling me the story, why am I listening to it? Why am I listening to you to you speak? So uh, some of those bits there, and we could kind of do that better, you know, more one-on-one -on -one than me just talking into the void, it's, it's kind of, tough with, um, with the narrating there, but any type of humanizing with the narration is important. Um, and also every person is going to have some, some quirk to how, to their, their speech that's going to make it difficult. Um, or, you know, they'll have some words that are tough to pronounce or slight lisps or whatever it is. So um, finding your own hangups is how you can identify them to get better. Okay. All right, so that's basically a review, and we could go on about all that stuff, but we gotta we gotta move on. All right, I think to get to some of the other very cool things. So, um, kind of related to that, 
uh, I'd like to talk about uh, reviewing, objective reviewing is how we, we did it. Um, so this is probably geared more towards the folks in the libraries, but I think if you're gonna be reviewing your material, I mean, if you're self-publishing a book, um, don't think just because you wrote it that you read it correctly. Uh, if you're gonna go back and listen to it and review, um, there are a couple of things here that make life really easy. So uh, with reviewing, what we would do often uh, for the library folks to, um, to just continue to make the product better is to get better at, uh, if we would have anybody else do reviewing for us, we would have volunteers do that, but then we would have, we would double check their work and you know, kind of be a reviewer for the reviewer always. And the way that we did things is we'd review and then somebody from the staff would go in and pick up corrections, fix anything that could be fixed. And there's a lot that you can do with that with just editing typically. Uh, but there won't, there will be other things that you can't and you're gonna have to re-record. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit today, putting in the corrections, which was a huge game changer for, for us for sure um, with, with moving to Hindenburg. But so with reviewing, um, you want to be able to make sure that you can hear everything that's in the background, stomach gurgles, any other, you know, uh, noises of whatever traffic or unwanted sounds that are in the audio file. Um, so you need to be able to have it loud enough that you can hear it. It's kind of obvious, but uh, what we would do is you'd li be listening along, uh, just using playback, recording again, if you, you know, we're going to also, uh, what we would do here, if you're in reviewing mode, is one of those options, I'll just go here and do it with that, in preferences, uh, is the return on stop. Uh, what this means here, this box is checked. And this is what you would want if you were in the process of recording. And the reason for that is that, um, you know, you're trying to listen to a place and let's say you find it, uh, sorry here. You found the place that you want to begin again, okay? And it's just, oh, I want to begin it uh, right there at and. So, okay, yeah. and press the space bar again and it returns to where you are. But if you were reviewing and you listened to 30 or 40 minutes of audio, let's say, and then you press that space bar and it returned all the way back, uh, it would be a you know a whole hassle of trying to find out you know where you were. So for reviewing, uh, we'd always want to change that. And we go to preferences, interface, and this option here, return on stop. And you just uncheck that. Now when I hit the space bar, you'll see that the cursor uh, is going along. And when I hit the space bar a second time, it'll stop wherever it ends up, okay? And it's just recording as, as it normally would. Okay, so let's say I heard something there and I wanted to uh, stop it. Okay. So I, I press the space bar, it stops right where it is. Uh, then in this black area, I would add a marker. Okay. And that's easy. I'm just right clicking and in the black area, a drop down menu comes up and you have this option of add marker. And there are key shortcuts for all these things. Um, but I'm not going to get into that today. So this marker comes up. Once that happens, if you do the same process right on the marker. And you can tell when you're on it by this turning into a little hand icon. You right click on it and you select this option rename. And then you type in like awkward pause or whatever you wanna say. And that's there in the file. And then if somebody else needed to look in the file, you'll, there'll be a series of these orange markers that tell us you know, what's going on and what you heard and someone could listen to it and fix the problem and you know, take out the marker. Uh, there's also a list here of markers. I don't know where it is, okay, there it came up there. And you know, this will be filled with, if it's a book, you know, maybe hundreds of markers, hopefully not. Um, but there's a list of them there if you wanna see that. That's also just good for um, keeping track, like how many times did this person mispronounce this word and it's there, you know, in a list as opposed to looking at it in the file. So uh, that's how the markers work there. All right, objective reading. Doo -doo 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 -doo. Okay, so that brings us to the next thing. Let's say um, there's something that you know we can't fix. Uh, let's talk about how we put in these uh, corrections. So I don't know how you guys are doing that with 
uh, the programs that you're currently using. Um, I've done this in the past where we recorded on separate files, took bits of the audio and tried to splice it in. Um, you know, sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't, but it's definitely labor intensive. And then you don't get the actual um, audio around it if you're recording kind of in a vacuum like that. So this was huge for us and just how this works. We found this to be just very, very user friendly. Um, so let's say I needed to re-record this section here. And it doesn't matter about the uh, marker. Uh, I'm sorry, the nav point here. I, I moved it out of the way. Um, just to have, and I'll just get rid of it. Just to have one less thing there. But it, it doesn't interfere with this part at all. So let's say I, I hear this section and I, I, I listen to it and I just think I don't really... Mm, we, we want to re-record that, okay? So I've highlighted the area and unlike before we put the marker in, we're in the black uh, area above the, the uh, edit window or above the waveform. Um, we're just gonna be right clicking exactly on the file itself and it'll bring up a separate, separate drop down menu. So up here brings up this one where you can add a marker and here is a different one. Okay, and some of these options here, um, you can actually from this import into this area or export just this selection. Uh, we'll get into exporting stuff later, but this, it works this way too. Um, but we wanna record selection. And when we do that, it's going to give us the same pre-roll um, and it doesn't matter that the cursor is in a different spot it's only gonna put whatever we record now into the section that we've highlighted, okay? So we're gonna hit record selection. We're gonna hear a bit of that pre-roll and we're gonna put in our new, you know, corrected audio. So this is really huge because you get to hear in context your pacing and your delivery from what you just did. Even if you are putting in a correction for something you recorded, you know, two months ago, okay? So it's so much better for getting a performance that matches what was delivered before. Before, So here it is, uh, forward arrow. And then I'm recording the correction and it's going in this space. Now I'm gonna keep talking because I never get tired of my own voice. And you can see here that uh, it's a little bit uh, strange because I've gone over the area that we want to put the correction in. I put this much longer thing in. So it might seem like I'm overriding the audio that was there before, which would be a, you know, a big mistake. But when I stop the recording, which why can I do that? Hold on one sec. All right, so when you stop the recording, that's weird, okay. Uh, you can see that everything that was after that is still there. So even though I recorded this long, long-winded uh, example here, um, everything that came after it didn't get overridden. So if your correction, um, let's say you're just putting in a sentence and the corrected version is a little bit longer than the audio that was there initially, it doesn't matter. It automatically corrects for that. So that's a huge, huge thing for us. And it takes a, a lot of the, uh, uh, and it just makes it easier with editing in the corrections. So, does anybody have questions about that? No? Great. <laughs> okay. So hopefully that uh, makes sense with uh, the folks working in the libraries, but also that feature is just huge for um, re recording audiobooks of any type, okay? Um, let's talk about levels, noise levels, RMS, and that kind of thing. Um, so I think that there are maybe some different standards in Europe for America or America, um, but exporting the book is where things can, uh, I feel like, be needlessly complicated. And again, the idea with this is that it's very uh, simple. So RMS is an over it's an overall loudness uh, metering of, of you know, your audio file, the book. And so when you export it out 
uh, and if you wanted to play on either uh, players or uh, ACX or wherever, it's going to have to be at a certain level of, of loudness. So they're going to have a standard for RMS, which is rate metering squared. So, uh, but what, what it means is the overall level of, of the audio, basically. Uh, so unlike a peak, so if you had like this peak here, um, and it was really loud. I'm just going to make that really loud. And let's say it was clipping and that kind of thing. Um, a peak metering is uh, monitoring just that peak. RMS would be basically monitoring the, the loudness of the whole file. It's kind of the easy way to, to know it. So uh, if you are recording, um, we talked a little bit about this in previous sessions, uh, it records with this auto level function. Right, so it's auto leveling as you record, and it is adjusting it to be at the level uh, that you'll need to export it at. So it kind of makes this a lot easier. Now you could turn that off, and you could record without that, and you could auto level it afterwards. You just select the whole file and auto level. Okay, um, that's one way of doing it. But if you wanted to know what the RMS level is, um, you know, to adjust it and that kind of thing. Uh, if you go over here to view, you're going to find uh, view statistics, or oh, sorry, in tools, view statistics. Okay, and this will have uh, the RMS, well, it's, it's doing it for the, just for the bit that I highlighted there. All right, view statistics. Here it'll tell you the RMS levels of the whole file um, and this bit here um, the a weighted option that is adjusting for um, not only the audio itself but the spaces in between um, so if you need to know the a weighted audio um, versus the rms level for when you export it out it's there and i can answer any questions about the differences between those maybe at the end if um, if some folks have them. Okay, uh, so hang tight here one sec. Okay, so let's talk about um, exporting in general. Um, there are a few options here of, of how to do that. Uh, one of them is, let's say you wanted to export just a certain section of it. Anything that you highlight, you can do the same right click on and you can export that selection. Um, and then you just choose your desktop or wherever you want to put it and it'll go there. Okay, so sometimes you need to do that. Um, I do that all the time with things. And when you do that, might as well go through it you have the option of changing if you want it to be an mp3 or a wave or whatever okay uh so and you have this option here too in the upper right corner of the uh of the program you, you have this export option which has a second drop down menu here and this is where you can export either the whole file just as one audio file or a selection like we what we just were looking at Okay, or you can export it as an audiobook or export for ACX. So uh, I'll talk about the ACX thing first and then we'll, we'll talk about the audiobook part after that. So when you export for ACX, ACX is the company that Audi uh, Audible uses to deal with the, uh, to take in all of their potential audiobooks and make sure that they basically play at the, they have a set of standards, play at the same volume and that they have headings that are, you know, there's, they have a standard of, you need to have some certain amount of time at a heading, like two seconds of space before you say chapter one, and then a second afterwards, and then the audio starts, that kind of thing. So it's, it could be a quite a, a, a problematic thing to be, going through this process of you've recorded your audiobook, you think you've done it right, and you want to uh, submit it to ACX, and you do that, and then they return it to you after some time and say, this is a problem, this is a problem, this is a problem. 
Then you go back and you fix it. Maybe you re-deliver it to them. Then they say, oh, but chapter four was a little off here or something like that. So to avoid some of that and to make this kind of like all you know, in-house, this option export for ACX is uh, you know, really great. What it does is it's gonna analyze the whole file and you'll have to imagine that there's a whole audio book with all of your headings and all that stuff. And it's going to tell you the problems that are with it. So you do that and it, it tells you, so you know, there's, the pause is less than what it needs to be here. The pause after the heading is, you know, or, or greater than what it needs to be here. The level is too low for heading one, et cetera, et cetera. So it gives you this rundown list and you can easily go through then afterwards, see, oh, this heading, I have to change this thing. And you, you, know, you go to the different parts of the book and you go in and you adjust the thing that needs to be adjusted. That's a huge time saver. And it just makes sure that all of your ducks in a row, so then when you um, deliver it to ACX, everything is taken care of. Okay, uh, and one other thing with that, um, with the ACX bit, uh, we're gonna talk about the properties window here. Okay, I'm gonna get to this in just a sec, but to stay on the ACX, um, train here. Uh, so in the properties window, uh, there are, you know, a few of these uh, different tabs. This is the first one, second one, the third one, uh, or the fourth one rather, the book export tab is where you can choose how you want to, um, you can customize some of your options a little bit. So it's going to be an audio book. You could have it be an MP3 file or something else. Um, we have it set as a WAV file. Here are options for um, you know, different sample rates, uh, that kind of thing. Pretty standard there. But this area here is where it's, it's uh, not so standard. So the split level, um, what this means is how it's, Hindenburg is going to export the book. And so when you have it set at one, it's going to export it as one audio file, one audio book. Um, but when you change the split level, to two or three, it's going to export the, uh, the different levels that you have in the book. So for instance, mine here, my fake book he here has two levels, uh, header one and header two, or let's just call them parts and chapters. Let's say parts are at level one, chapters at level two. So when I export it here and I change the level, it's gonna export all of the parts, or you could have it export all of the chapters. And I believe for ACX, they have you uh, submit the books at two levels or, th or three levels or something like that. So this is where you can do that. And again, it's just very easy to do that here. You just, you know, it's just as simple as that. Uh, so again, if this was a recipe book and there were parts um, and sections and different recipes, you could, you could export it however you wanted to, okay? So that's um, how this works for ACX, which is, you know, um, pretty easy here. So let's look at this. So for the folks that are working for the public libraries, um, there's some, some of the stuff here is, is specific to that. So again, if you're making your audiobook and you want to just export it as an audiobook, you can just export it as just audio. Um, you can do it that ACX option, which is might be good to have it even if you were exporting in a different uh, to be played somewhere else or something like that. It might be good to still use that function just to know what the industry standard is and you might as well adjust your book to that anyway, I would think at least. Um, but if you are working in the library system um, and your books need to play on uh, some of these players or you need to um, include the metadata for your books, this is where you would do that here. Um, some of this is self-explanatory, uh, but the things like the base file name and stuff, I'm sure there's, you know, you have your own numbering system, uh, but we would have to have, you know, certain, um, certain amount of these fields fi filled in so that it could play on the player. And so the way that this worked uh, for the version that's specific to NLS uh, here in the States, and I don't know about the, the European equivalent, but the books actually wouldn't 
this wouldn't export the audiobook unless you filled out these five fields, which I think was title, um, the base file name, uh, and definitely the identifier line. So for us, this is what we would have. Um, it's, it's our little library code and then whatever the base file name was for that book. So that's what all this stuff here. And then the subjects, uh, uh, ISBN number, those, those types of things. Um, that's, you know, for library uh, cataloging. So um, to have this all in kind of one spot, again, the system that we had used before switching to this was we would do all the editing and all the audio stuff in one area. Then we'd send that finished file into the separate program to do this part of it. And it was, it, there were always problems. And if you messed anything up and we, you know, you'd have to assign all the nav points and everything at the end. And this, you just do it all as you're going along. And then it, at, when you get to this section, you just fill in these fields or you can do it beforehand too. Um, and you fill in all this stuff and then you export the audio book and it, you know, is ready for the players with all the data and all that there. Okay. Um, the last tab over here. Um, so I'll, I'll just go through them all. This is the first one, intro. Second one, tracks. We're using one track. It's pretty, pretty easy. So there's the track. But you can add more uh, and you can have, uh, you know, multi-track going here. The styles window we talked about in the, in the past. This is where you can assign the nav points and you can, um, you know, if you know that they're all named chapter or whatever, you can change the text here or you could change it in the manuscript however you want to do that. But you can change all of your headings there in the styles window, the exporting uh, tab we looked at, and defaults are that, uh, you know, I'm sure you can guess, but if there's a way that you want to set this up um, for any of these parameters, you can save your default session so that every time you open up a new session, it's saved that way. That's pretty huge too. And then if for whatever reason you want to change that, you have the other option, reset, and you go back to the way that it was before. Okay, so huge, um, you know, hugely helpful stuff um, to just make the process go smoother. I mean, the amount of time this changed uh, for us with corrections, final, final production, you know, just getting stuff out the door um, was huge. And then, you know, with uh, them adding the ACX feature, I mean, it makes this all, as user friendly as as I think it, it it gets for you know for some of this stuff. So um, another area that we didn't talk about too much because this is really specific is anybody recording with um, periodicals or doing magazines or anything that has many sections. Um, you can change from the all mode to leaf mode or, or branch mode, and you can record in one area, um, and you can record out of order which is also hugely helpful. So if you have a magazine, there are 20 people reading on it. It's, it's a, you know, a big one. Um, you can have people come in at different times and you don't have to record it in order, but when you're done, you go back to the all mode and all of the parts are there exactly how they're supposed to line up. That's, that was also pretty huge for us. So, um, with that, I think we want to turn it over to, um, to you folks to maybe answer some questions, unless there's something you'd like to add, Chuck? No, we can, yeah, we can jump into Q&A right now. We can do that. Well, let's just go ahead and have um, each individual person ask their question because we do have time and make it a little more interactive. So let's just start from the top. Um, the very first question was, uh, Meno, Menon, would you like to jump on and ask a question? Yes, um, actually, one of the questions, both questions are pretty much the same, and it was um, concerning how you could uh, kind of assemble every spot where first, well, first, where there was a re-recording, and I think you answered that, just saying that this is not a feature that exists. I'm talking about like the list you can have of markups when you found like some corrections that need to be, be made. You can have a list of that, 
but I just thought it would be nice to somehow be able to have a list of every spot where there was some re-recording that could become very extensive, but I think it could also be handy. Um, so the idea was to very quickly, as quickly as possible and as easily as possible, be able to go through without having to actually slide through the book uh, to see where there was errors or there was, you know, to make sure that the correct, that when there was a re-recording, it was well done. Do you understand what I mean? Yes. So let's say, I, I think I do. Um, let's say I wanted to, okay, so when somebody reviewed a book and they put in all these markers, right? And the marker here says, uh, whatever, wrong word, okay? Mm -hmm. Something like that. Yeah. Wrong word, okay? Uh, so then um, I come back later, I say, okay, we're gonna get to this area here, we need to re-record this correction. So I'm just gonna do it in, in real time here. So uh, I'm gonna do that thing here, record the click, record selection, which is putting in the correction. I never get tired of my own voice. And here I'm gonna hopefully say the right word and type it correctly, Roth word, okay? And then I'm gonna stop it. Um, what you could do is on this marker, you could, you could, it's already there. You could just rename it, you know, correction or however you wanna say that if you want to have your list or correction one, two or whatever, and it'll be there in the yeah. marker list. Yeah, what I actually meant was, um, and you, sh you actually answered that first question uh, earlier. You can see a list. You can go get the list of all the corrections that needs to be, that needs to be made, right? So yes. that is clear. But yes. I just uh, I just thought it would be handy to be able to quickly go from one spot when there was when there has been some re-recording to another. Oh, you like understand that. what yeah. I mean? Uh, just to jump from one correction to the next? Like, like every little that you re-record, like you're recording, you made a mistake, you start again, there's a little red, yellow arrow at the top of the wave, right? You have a list of all these little yellow arrows um. or quick go from one to another without scrolling you know scrolling is not great i don't know if <laughs> can you so, hear me yes your your pixel legs do you sound like you're from a distant galaxy uh it sounds so, good. which is funny <laughs> but uh, jonathan i think the question is is there a shortcut? Can we move between markers without having to scroll through the, the entire wave? Uh, in the marker list, you can do that. Let's uh, put in a few markers here. Uh, let us be by, you know, marker four, marker five. If you go to the marker list, he's already up, so here. Um, if you double click on it, see the cursor moving? So I got it does. Hang tight here. Ah, there's just so many, too many things. If you double click on the markers in the marker list, it'll go to them. Okay. So that's an easy way to do it, um, you know, in the file. And again, you could, when you do the correction, you could rename it. And then just afterwards, a person could go in and check to make sure those corrections sound good by just clicking on them like that. So hopefully, hopefully that answers that question. Anybody else? Yeah, it's Blair Sanders speaking. Uh, Jonathan, can I just ask a point of clarification? Yeah. As, as Manon was just saying, is it possible to skip from each new take in the recording? To skip from each new instance of where you start and stop recording? Oh, uh, okay. Yes, uh, I think so. By hitting the tab button, you'll be going to, and if you can imagine the markers aren't there, you'll be going to every new um, 
point uh, where where there's a split point. Um, that's probably the easiest way to do it there. I'm just hitting tab and it just cycles through them. Uh, that's the way I would do it. Is uh, is that where you were, um, where you were so, thinking? So does that, does that just say that each time you start the recording anew, you're creating a split point? So a split yeah. point means new recording began at that point. Yes, so I'll just do it here. Here we are at the end of the file. So let's just say I was doing this and uh, I wanted to re-record this sentence here. Okay, so I find my spot and I'm gonna do the recording. Why don't you stop the recording? All right, and here I am beginning again and babadoo babadoo boo. All right. And if I, you know, go and then if I let you know, I'll, I'll do it again. We'll we'll add another one, babadoo babadoo boo. All right. Here I am adding another one. Each time you do it, it makes another segment of audio, which you yep. can, you know, uh, select individually. And then you can go from segment to segment by hitting tab. Nice. Yeah, I okay. use that a lot with the editing, just, just cycling through that. And, and same thing with the marker window, just like, boom, go to the marker, da 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 da. Yeah. Sure. I also would. Often you know, what we do when, when in our process of reviewing, we verify the integrity of each retake point. Totally. Sure it's Absolutely. Clean. Yeah. And one thing with that, we spent a lot of time uh, with training our volunteers when they got, you know, a handle on the technical part is when doing um, a pickup, we, we would be just really adamant that let's just say this is the spot you're picking up. It's in between, um, you know, here's our new sentence. Here's the sentence that was fine. We would always have them put the cursor to the left side of that space and be really adamant that they're not cutting anything off here. Um, and let's say we're re-recording over this, that they're not doing it in the middle. And the reason for that is that any of the artifacts left, you know, from the previous take will be there. So we get, you know, make sure to really spend our time doing that. And then when you do the, the pickup, uh, just for them to do the breath intake during the pre-roll, so I'll over exaggerate it here on breath intake so that then they could pick up and do this as opposed to uh, doing the same thing, but waiting till you got to the cursor to then, you know, breathe in and do on. that. Don't you stop the recording? That's how people would, would do it maybe naturally. And they, uh, we, we spent a fair amount of time, you know, trying to get folks to get away from that because the audio just moves better. Now you can edit anything out later, but again, if you do this right, you don't have to edit, edit anything at all. And you know, people that are really good, you can't tell anywhere where they started and stopped. Okay, uh, Vivica, do you want to jump on and ask your question? Yes, I have a couple of questions. Um, I think I will start with, uh, I do commercials as well. And uh, a customer asked me, could you just mark every take and then send me take three and seven? Uh, is there a way to do that? Uh, well, mark every take. So take three. I know, and, you know, it's just rolling and I'm doing it over and over again. And we are on Zoom and they can hear my recording. Got recording. it. So it's just doing this and you go, yeah. here yeah. I am, ba -ba 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 -boo. Yeah. here yeah. I am, take two, the same thing I said, okay. Yeah. yeah, so that's, that's pretty easy. So what you do is you'd stop it and you'd find out which everyone, oh, send me take one and take two. You could mark it yourself um, just to know oh, this was yeah. take one. This okay, was take perfect. Yeah, five. yeah. And then uh, you could highlight that section that you wanted, that was the take you wanted to keep. And then you can just export that selection. Just yes. that one. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. Uh, then I, um, I heard you said you use the computer when you record and you use uh, forward arrow um, to, uh, to start uh, recording. And yep. But you also use it then when you, when you uh, jump in the, in the script, right? The text. Um, you can, while you're recording, if you, if you built the manuscript, um, beforehand, there, yeah. there are different ways to do this. If you did it beforehand and, um, let me do this. Let me get, 
and get the nav points out of here. So you you know you've got the parts of your book there, and it says chapter one, chapter two, etc. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, a whole chapter can't be on the page, so you have to kind of roll the script down. Well, oh, this is the main. Actually, when I use the the arrow, uh, or yeah, the forward arrow, um, it makes a noise, it makes a sound, and it's recorded. Right. So this is when, sorry, uh, this is when you're talking about you've put, you've uh, opened your book, um, yeah. the text of your book in the manuscript. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let me do that. Okay. And let me see. Here. Where are you now? Sorry. How can I find? Okay. It has nothing. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so I'm starting a new session here. Okay, so this is where you've, um, like what you've had before, where you opened your book yeah. in the, uh, you know, in the file. And then you have this here, and you're reading along, Bridget Jones's Diary by Helen Fielding, Contents. You read that a lot. <laughs> I know, I know. I got to get a new book here. I don't know why this one is the uh, of all the books. Um, but uh, so... With the clicking, it's true. There's not a great um, option for that, uh, except one thing I would say is that, you know, uh, not all clicks are the same. So, I mean, my, I'm doing this now and my finger is on the arrow. It is always going to make some sounds. Yeah. I don't and know if you can you remove that afterwards because the customer wasn't satisfied with that? Can you remove it afterwards? Yeah. That's, uh, you would have... Um, your that's just you know your editing um, where you would you could uh, one way to remove it if it's really clear and it's only the click sound and no other ambient noise you can just cut it away so I just highlighted it and uh, uh, went with a cut but if you, I would if you want it to be um, you know more uh, you know clear with the audio there sorry I've got to um, Get the favorites window up. Okay, it's gonna. I'm gonna. You're gonna uh, put it. Uh, no sound. Yeah, we're just gonna paste this in here. So you just highlight this area that you want to um, change, for example, and then you come over here to the in the favorites window where I've recorded some room tone, which just recorded silence, and you want to do that in the room that you're recording the book in. Yeah, and you just paste in the clip, and that'll get rid of that there. And there are keyboard shortcuts so that that's very fast. You know, you can become very fast. And then you always want to check your your work to make sure. I don't know if you, you didn't cut anything off. Yeah. Um. But so you can do that. But that you're right. That could be uh, a lot of clicks, and I understand that. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I use a a separate tool to avoid, but I thought it was easier if I could do it. Okay, uh, another question is, uh, the first thing you said was, uh, when you stop, you click the, the backwards arrow. It doesn't stop for me there. And some, a lot of times it doesn't stop either when I press uh, space bar. So uh, I don't know if there's anything in my setting that should be different. Hmm. Let me just see here. I don't know if you can hear that. Yeah. Um, anything in your settings? Is this, are you, when you do that, are you in the record, is it record enabled? Yeah. Yeah. And so the, the forward there and the back arrow just aren't, or the back arrow or the space bar are not responding? Yeah. Hmm. So I have to click a lot of times sometimes, and that's really annoying because it takes time, right? Uh, yeah, but it, but it does eventually respond. Yeah, yeah. At some point, it does with the space bar, not not the, not the arrow. I think it would be nice if it was the arrow. So it might be something in my setting. I think. Hmm. Yeah. Um, do you happen to notice? You know what I would do um, is maybe also check in a different program anywhere you, you can use the arrow just to make sure that there's no I don't know connectivity problem or something, anything like that. Um, yeah. I, I've been using it this whole time, um, you know, 
that's also also when you're not in record mode and you are and you press the arrow or hold it down it it, it does this and goes through the uh the audio this way um and then pressing space bar will make some you know, sound play it i don't know if you can hear that better. so that's me playing it so so what did you do to make it move so fast was that the 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 arrow this right here like this yeah yeah, I'm holding down the back arrow. Yeah, I don't think it does that with mine either. Are you on a PC? No, I'm on a Mac. Hmm. I'm trying it now because I actually made a thing here. It's, no, it's, it's, it's going really slow. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. Right clicking and in the black area, a drop down. <laughs> I recorded you. <laughs> you this option. We are going to put this recording up later, so. Yeah. But I guess we screwed up the last one, so you know. No, no, it, it was not to record. It was just to to try to do some of the things in my own uh, program. Yep. Um, meanwhile, um, yeah. Um, okay. One question more. I wrote to support uh, a month ago and didn't get an answer. Is there a way to when you have a question that you can get an answer on your questions? Or I'm going to direct that to Chuck. Yeah, that the question should have been answered if it was a month ago. It's a, it's a bit long. Um, yeah. My suggestion would be to send one more, unfortunately, just to send one more support question, uh, okay. the same question saying, hey, I asked what's going on. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's unfortunate. I'm sorry about that. Yeah. Yeah. Alarm, alarm, help, help. Okay, okay. thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd also just like to answer a question that was asked last time. Um, Actually, Jonathan, let me let me hop in real quick. I just want to, and then uh, I'm going to take over the screen here. There was a question about whether or not we can add markers on the fly while we're recording. So let's say you have your arm track, your track armed, uh, and go ahead and hit record. All right. Okay. So it's going to be recording. Just hit your markers with your shortcuts. So for maybe command one, command two, three, four, five, six, seven, all the way through. So yes, uh, the short answer is yes, you can add markers on the fly while you record. And it, it's, it's pretty straightforward. But like Vivica was saying was, you know, to minimize the clicking sound, I, I typically use a membrane based yeah. Uh, but keyboard. So that was, yeah. Okay. All right, John, back to you. Back to me. Okay. Uh, all right. Sorry, you were going to say something. I interrupted. No, no, no. All good. Um, just real quickly, um, last time there was a question of how to add more than um, four slots. If you wanted, to, if you had things in here and you were, you know, you would, you would, um, you had, you had gone through all of your uh, options here. One simple way to do that is if you add a master track and that's done by uh, just right clicking uh, in this area over here and you can add a, a regular track or uh, a master track. And on the master track, you will get an additional four, um, four slots. So, um, that makes a lot of sense, of course, as well, if you are doing this with one track of audio, which most audiobooks are, but keep in mind that anything that's on the master track is going to affect all of the tracks. So um, I'm going to put this crazy uh, distortion delay that I have here, and that's on the master track. And then when we listen back, it's always going to make some sound. I don't know if you can hear, right? And that would be on all of them. But it would, if you wanted to have another slot that was just used for metering or some loudness metering or something like that, that's an easy way to do that there. And then you would free up a tr uh, other tracks to have on the um, on your narration. Uh, anybody else? I think that's it on the questions. Any more questions, guys? Feel free. Well, I got to, uh, hi, it's Robert again. I'll uh, tap you on some uh, volunteer specific type of uh, experience that you have. Yeah. So large part of our startup on every shift is trying to get levels set. Is there anything special that uh, makes that simpler or perhaps, yeah. Pro yeah. 
we would have we had four booths and i don't know let's say 40 volunteers so roughly 10 per booth or something like that but they would come in at different times um what we would do uh, oh this is another uh thing to keep in mind in general if you are too low uh meaning your the level is not set loud enough for hindenburg to to pick up the auto level actually can't work there is a lower threshold so um you de what we would do is we would find people's optimum uh level to set them at on um on our interface on you know the input and we just had a list outside the booth you know mary at four four o'clock meaning set the uh you know the dial at four or so and so at whatever and each time the narrators changed, we would, and they, you know, the volunteers weren't allowed to touch any of that. Or if you have a preamp that you're using, whatever, any of the settings that we, you would have, we would, we would set them at their um, customized levels. And, um, and we always had them check. And they, it was part of, we also gave the volunteers a rundown list to double check us. Maybe we forgot to do something like, like set their levels. Um, so we would have um, like a, a checklist for us that we would point, put outside the booth and a checklist for them. And part of their checklist was also um, make sure everything's okay. Mike's in the right spot. Chair height is where it normally is. Um, um, and then they would listen to maybe a, a, the last minute of what they did um, just to make sure that they're matching themselves in terms of tone or something. Uh, if you want to be really anal about it, you could have them record a sentence and then, but this is a good idea, honestly, for sessions that our hours were an hour, um, we would have them record a sentence, listen to it compared to the last, you know, where their last session ended. Maybe the last session ended and they're kind of groggy like this at the end or something, or they're just more low energy and they come in and like, here I am today. And it just sounds different. So, you know, how to, how to match them is just, there would be a checklist of things to do um, and just have them be, you know, kind of robotic about that. Like this is, this is, uh, we call it daycare for adults, but um, it was just the, the, it absolutely makes a difference with consistency, which is the big thing with doing this. Um, so that was huge. And if the levels are set wrong would, because you need different levels for different people, you know, somebody comes in, they have a huge boisterous voice and somebody has a very quiet voice. The input level is gonna be very different. So, you know, obviously that's gonna affect the audio pretty drastically. So. Uh, just consistency with that is like get to find their optimum level um, where it sounds good. Also, you know, making sure that it's recording into the program at the right level and we would set them at that. Hopefully, does that help? Oh, yeah. No, that's excellent. Thank you. Sure. Jonathan, on that note, actually, we hit the bottom of the, of the training hour. So we're good. All right. Okay. So I definitely appreciate everyone from being here. Uh, if there are any other questions, please feel free to ask. Otherwise, um, we'll definitely have this recorded this time as opposed to last time, whatever happened last time. And we'll push this out to you. Um, yeah. Yes, thank you very much, everybody, for, for showing up. Hopefully this was helpful. Um, and, uh, you know, again, I mean, just going from the experience of not using this to using this, uh, it's, it's pretty clear that everyone, you know, it was a game changer um, for us with, with just ease and just getting things out the door. Um, you know, it's, it's pretty great. All right. Thanks again, guys. And we'll see you hopefully on another training. Bye. All right. Bye everybody.